podcast for you. I'm getting better at this. Hey everyone, welcome to part four of Let's Talk About HIV. So I hope you've had a chance to look at my first three parts, sections one, two, and three. If you haven't, go back there because a lot of my stories build on each other and I refer to other things that occurred in other episodes. So if you, for those of you who have not looked at the other three, I'll give you a brief summary. I used to be an STD counselor for years when I worked and lived in California. STD counseling was one of my part-time positions to earn extra money. And so I've always kept up with STDs and STIs and community. And I'm, I'm that friend that talks to all the other friends about making sure you get tested, don't go too far until you get tested, blah, blah, blah. So even though they don't want to hear it, I don't, I don't want to talk about it, things happen in my friends' lives that bring my words back up to them. And then when they, when they get to that moment where they have to deal with the idea of getting tested or possibly having HIV or any other STD or STI, they call me on the phone and let me talk. Many times I've gone with my friends to the doctor or to the testing center, or we've taken you know, home testing kits and I was there with them holding their hands and talking to them and keeping them from bouncing off the walls as we waited for the test results to come back. So this next segment is a real serious one. All right. Um, this was so serious that it actually just kind of made me cry. So this is this is one of my male friends who came and spoke to me. Very beautiful man, beautiful, um, heterosexual, black man. Uh, works hard. Not married. Never been married. Doesn't have any children. You know, but has a very active sex life. So. We are just friends. We put it out there. We are just platonic friends. We have no attraction to each other whatsoever. So we have really nice, good, candid talks. Sometimes when we go out, we go out together. And we, you know, just chit chat and catch up with each other. So he is in a relationship with a woman that he is attempting to be monogamous with. He's never had long-term monogamy because he always thought he could not be with more, he could not just be with one person. He had to have several girlfriends and several women. The older he gets, the less satisfying that lifestyle is becoming for him. And he found a woman that he, you know, pretty much just loves, he loves her. And he said he finally found somebody that he thinks he could marry and have children with and that he thinks he could tolerate. Now, here's the situation. His normal protocol is that within, by the first, second, or third date, he's having sexual relations with the woman that he happens to be with at the moment. He has dated this woman for 12 months, and they have never been sexually active. They've kissed. They've had lots of heavy makeout sessions, but they've never been sexually active because she is demanding that he gets tested. She said, and he, he, his response was, well, I can use condoms, condoms, you know, are great protection. And she said, no, condoms can break. I said, wow, she sounds like my clone. I've said that a couple of times to men, condoms break. So she said, no, con that condom could break. I need you to get tested so that if that condom breaks, if it slips off or if we get carried away in the moment, she said, I know what my, what my risk factor is and, as I deal with you. And his way of dealing with it was to say, okay, fine, you know, I like her. I, I enjoy my time with her. I'll just take her out and we'll just do things and we'll just kiss or whatever, but I'm going to go take care of my sexual needs elsewhere. She finally pushed the issue and she confronted him and said, are you having sex with other people? If you are, I'm out of here. Because this is, these are her words. Again, I'm summarizing a summary. Her words were, she said, I'm celibate and I'm waiting for you to do what you need to do so we can have take this relationship to the next level. She said, I've been dating you exclusively for a year and other men come up to me. What's going on? Why? What? What's going on here? Are you having sex with other people? He had this big blow up. He admitted to her that he was all of this stuff. They were going back and forth for a couple of weeks and they finally had a deep, deep talk about what was going on and why he didn't want to get tested and why he was having sex with other people, all of this stuff. So he came to me 
And I said, I don't know what kind of, excuse me, I don't know what kind of sympathy you want from me. I'm a female. You, you, you kept this girl going for 12 months and she's celibate and waiting on you and you're doing what you want to do, getting your knees met and she's not. What do you want me to say? I'm your friend, but I'm not going to lie to you. And he said, I, he said, I need to talk to you about the reason why I won't get tested. And, and he was serious and he, I could tell that what he was about to say to me was going to be very painful. So I said, okay, well, come on over. So I, I pulled out, you know, a bottle of wine and some chicken wings that I got from Fresh Market and some cheese and crackers and some celery. You know, that's all I had in my refrigerator. And I put it out there. I said, it's going to be a night. And I had some nice little calm music in the background. And, you know, I just said, let me just, you know, I prayed and just made sure the atmosphere was real warm. And I said, okay, something's going on here. This is about to be serious. So I got my spirit together because you can just tell when something's going to be painful. Sometimes you can't take it. Sometimes you just don't want to hear it. You don't want to know. It's like, come on, I'm, I'm having a good life. I don't want to know about your pain. But when you have really good friends, you got to be there for them. So he came over and he just kind of sat looking at me and I just prepared for the worst. And he said, he said, he just, his first words after just five minutes of looking at me and sighing and looking out into space, you know, and sipping on wine, he said, Kenya, he said, I was raped on three separate occasions by women. And I just, I didn't know how to process that. Now, I know it's possible for me to be raped. I know that. I know that theoretically. I know that. I'm used to seeing that, or not used to seeing it, but I'm used to understanding that in the context of, <clears throat> excuse me, in the context of the it being a child, you know, um, statutory rape, like teenagers who have sex with their children or children who are like sexually molested by babysitters. But he made it very clear that he was an adult all three times and that he was taken advantage of and he was raped. Now, this man is 6'6", 225 pounds of lean muscle. He's an athlete, you know, strong dominant alpha heterosexual male and i'm just giving you the background i don't know if that had any value for you but i'm just giving you the background on what kind of man this is this is this is just you know a strong man and so i said okay so i just looked at him and i listened i said okay i'm here and and if i tell you this story i'll let you know how this ties back to what happened with his, his girlfriend so he said he said the first time it happened was let me say it happened 11 years 11 years ago 12 years ago now he said 12 years ago he was at a club in atlanta and he was having a drink with a woman that he'd met and he got he remembers being a little bit woozy and the next thing he remembered the next thing he knew he woke up in a van in the back of the parking lot he said he was fully dressed when he woke up, it felt as if he had been manipulated. Like he felt like his, his genitals had been manipulated. He said, and I said, so what do you mean? He said, I, he said, I think someone had sex with me. He said, I don't know if it was, um, my ear is hurting. He said, I don't know if it was a male or a female. He said, I think, he said, I don't know what happened to me. And, you know, and he did, he kind of, he didn't start crying, but he was just really sad. And so I sat beside him and I rubbed his back. I said, okay. I said, so let, I said, if you don't have to talk about it, if you don't want to. He said, I have to talk about this because it's affecting everything else in my life now. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he said, that the, I said, did you go to the doctor or go to the police? He said, no, I was too embarrassed. And, you know, I said, do you think you were raped anally? And he said he felt the, you know, his, his, his derriere, his rear, and he didn't feel as if anything had penetrated him from the back. He felt like his genitals had been manipulated. He felt like, he said, he said men can tell when they've ejaculated and when they've had 
sex and he felt like there's something had happened there. But he never found the woman. Please go sit down. My dog sitting right next to me. Hard. And he said he felt as if he uh, something had happened. And he, he looked around. He got off the van. I said, I said, did you see anything? Anything I anything I identify information, an ID or something, you should look in the glove compartment to see what this van this was. He said he didn't. He just got in his car. He said it was about two in the morning. He got in his car and he left. And his car was the only car in the in the parking lot besides the van. He didn't get information for the license plate, anything. He didn't go back to find out who he had been with. He didn't go ask for cameras to see if he could if they could see who he was with or what had happened. It just happened. That was the first thing that happened. He never got tested after that. He said he would just, he just put it out of his mind. Then it happened again, which is highly unusual. So now, you know, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm just probably going to be a two part video. And um, no, you're going to just going to be the whole video because I'm just going to talk about it. Then he said it happened again in 2010. And this time, one of his sisters he said one of his sisters did something when he went back home. And I said, what? And he just kind of got real quiet because I know his family members. I know his sisters because I've been invited to a couple of family events as a family friend. So I know everybody. And I said, so what happened? And he said, there was a lady at a party that their family had a family get together. And that lady was hitting on him. You know, she was pretty, but he wasn't interested. He just wasn't interested in her. He said she was African and um, didn't have, you know, a green car. She wasn't legal, but she was just there working and was always trying to get with him. And he felt as if that she just wanted to be with him because she wanted somebody to get married to and have a green card. And he didn't want to be a part of that. He said he woke up, he said he was a little bit drunk and a little bit woozy and he felt like something, what did he say? He said he felt like, he, he, just, he can't remember if he was just very drunk or if, or maybe he was drugged. But at one point he went to one of the guest bedrooms of his mom's house why everybody was still in the front and outside, you know, having a party. And that when he woke up, there was a lady on top of him. He was naked from the waist down. She was naked and she was on top of him having sex with him. And he woke up as he ejaculated. And it was very painful for him to tell me this. And it was painful for me to hear this. And I'm like, wow. And so... He said he looked at her, he threw her off of him and said, what are you doing? He said his sister was peeping, one of his adult sisters, he's an adult too, everybody's an adult, one of his adult sisters were looking, was looking around the door as this was happening. And that his adult sister, later on, as all this, all the information came out, his sister had helped this lady get access to him while he was asleep. So pretty much she set this up. So his sister helped him get raped. <clears throat> I said, which one? Guess he has three. Now I'm angry. Like I'm, I'm ready to put, put fists on some people. Oh, I'm ready to stomp some women down. And he said, I don't want you to know which one because you would never believe it. So I just started naming out names. Which one? Let's go. Let's go right now. He said, Kenya, this happened in 2010. I said, you had me at your house with these people. I said, I don't tolerate sexual predators. I don't care how long ago it happened, who they are, how old they were. There is no level of forgiveness. I'm not Jesus. You can't come back from certain things with me. I said it like that. He said, I'm never going to tell you because you probably would stomp her. I said, I sure would stomp her. <laughs> I would stomp her. Oh, so I'm just sad at this point. Now I'm crying. He's crying. And um, he never got tested. I said, do you know she's pregnant? Do you know if anybody's pregnant with a baby from you? Because as far as he knows, he has no babies. He said, I just don't know. He said, I could have possibly two babies out there. And 
I said, so what's the relationship now between you and this sister? Because I can't tell which one it is because you treat all of them equally. He said, you know, I, he said, I've forgiven her. And she explained that she was just trying to hook me up with somebody and thought we'd be a good couple. I said, it doesn't make any sense. You don't hook somebody up by helping them get raped. What? That, that, make, that makes no sense. So I'm looking at him like, okay, this, this is deep. Then he says it happened the third time. Now I'm looking at him like, what in the world? What are the odds of it happening one time, but then twice is a lot, and it's a family member, and now it happened the third time? I'll deal with that issue later. <clears throat> and I said, okay, babe. Um, you know, I'm trying to keep the confusion out of my face because, again, when you're dealing with people who have gone through painful situations, they're the only one in your room who can afford to bounce off the walls. You have to stay calm, non-judgmental, judgment-free zone at all times. I said, okay, what happened the third time? He said in 2015, he went to a party where there was a, a party with a bunch of Africans. So I see a theme, a common theme happening here. I said, okay, so... I said, stop, let me stop you for a moment. You have a lot of African friends and you hang in the African community because you're not African. And he said, he said, well, yeah, I live in, he said, I live in Stone Mountain. And he said, there's lots of Africans there. And he said, African women just love me. And, you know, he does have a certain look. He's very tall. He's dark. He's a very, very strong ethnic feature. He's a very handsome man, beautiful white teeth. He's stable. He has his own home. You know, no children that we apparently know about. You know, he's just like the perfect catch. And there are lots of African women here in uh, in Georgia who are not citizens. You know, they, they're here working and stuff, but they're not citizens. And, you know, they're very eager to practice hypergamy. And they're very eager to get married. You know, and they'll marry whoever will marry them. Okay, so... I said, how many Africans were at the party? And he said, it was a party. It was one of my Facebook friends and she had a party and um, there was lots of African women and they were all flirting with me. And he said, it was one lady in particular who was there. And he said, he later learned it was her house. And she and her sisters were really trying to encourage him like to date his, to date her. And he said he told her very clearly, I am not interested in dating anybody who is not already a citizen of the United States because I don't want to deal with green card issues or any of that stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she, she seemed to be okay with it. She also had a couple of brothers there at the, at the party. And I said, did anything seem dark or strange about your environment? He said, and he said no. He said it just looked like a house party with people who are educated. You know, some of them were doctors, some were nurses, some were teachers. Everybody there had a job and seemed well put together, very classy. They spoke several languages. Everybody had their acts together. And it never, it wasn't something you would, it, it wasn't like you would call a hood party where everybody's in there carrying guns and speaking eubonics and acting crazy. It was just a regular classy party with um, significantly African and, and that's it. I said, okay. He said that at one point, the woman said to him, you're drinking a Heineken? Let me take that Heineken from you and get you something stronger. And she said, he said, oh, okay. And she brought him um, a, a glass of alcohol that was kind of strong drink. And he took a sip and he said, oh, I don't like that. I want my Heineken. He said, okay. She brought him back the Heineken. He see another Heineken. He began drinking the Heineken, and he, and he said after about two or three sips, he said, man, this is strong. This is a strong Heineken, and I don't know what's going on. He said, what's going on with this Heineken? And all he remembers is being led to down, down the hallway to a back room, and he doesn't remember anything else. He woke up. All of his clothes were off. She was in bed beside him. All of her clothes were off, and... All of a sudden, what woke him up was her sister and her brother burst through the door saying, what kind of man are you? What kind of man are you? This is the next day, mind you. This is like 10 o'clock in the morning the next day. What kind of man are you? 
What kind of man are you? You taking advantage of our sister. You must now marry her. Woo, if this had been my brother, I would be in prison. <laughs> I would be in prison, people. I would be in prison. What kind of predatory nonsense is this? So as he's talking, at this point, my friend is crying. And I'm trying hard to keep my composure because I just want to jump in the car and go and go get a baseball bat and start doing some things to people. I just, I just, I don't feel good at this point. Like I have to stick to my stomach listening to this. And I said, okay. <clears throat> okay. So this person did this to you? I believed him. I totally believed him. He, he was crying. He said, Kenya, I felt so ashamed. I felt so embarrassed. I was confused. I felt a little bit groggy. They threatened to call the police. They threatened to blackmail me. They threatened all kinds of stuff. They said, you must marry our sister. You have defiled her and now you must marry her. It's the right thing to do. Our sister could be pregnant and you've done this to our sister. I said, what was the lady doing while they were saying all these ridiculous things? He said, she was just lying there looking at me. I said, are you sure you had sex? Are you sure they didn't just like, just plant you and just take your clothes off? He said, oh no. He said, I saw the sheets. He said, he said there was semen all over the sheets. And he said, there was like, you know, her bodily fluids were around his genital area. He said, again, men can tell when they've ejaculated. He said, he said there were some areas down there which were very, very tender and very painful. And he said, I'm gonna get kind of graphic you all, so I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, I'm trying to give you a complete picture of what happened to him. He said, it, he said she may have been really tight because he was kind of pain down there in his genital area. And I said, so now, you know, I, I'm just sitting there and I'm just listening, you know, and I'm just listening, trying to maintain my composure because I feel so bad for my friend. <clears throat> so I just let him sit. I went and gave him a glass of wine. Then I said, you know what? Why don't you pour your own wine? I don't want you thinking I'm doing anything. Because after hearing that, I'm like, oh, my God. And he just looked at me like, can you really? I said, like, I'm really here. You go get your own bottle of wine. And um, so we're sitting there drinking and talking. And I said, okay. I said, maybe you need to go get some counseling. I said, I said, you know, I can recommend some people, some um, actually men who counsel men who have been, who have been raped and sexually preyed upon. And he said, right now, I'm not ready to do that. He said, but what has happened to me is now affecting my relationship with the woman that I love and that I would like to marry and have children with. And he explained to me how she's been asking him to get tested because he's, he's made advances to her to have sex, but you know, with a condom and she's refusing. She's like, we're gonna use condoms, but you still have to get tested. And they got into a big argument. He didn't tell her why, you know? And so he's coming to me to explain to me, how does he tell her and, you know, he just doesn't know what to do and he's just, paralyzed right now and I said well I said the first thing we need to do is get you tested I said no and, and he knows how I how I explain this I said we can do it I said I can go to the doctor with you I can go to a clinic with you I can go to a lab with you we can go get a test from Walgreens it costs about 40 bucks at Walgreens we can take the home swab test we can do all of that now and he asked me you know wouldn't he know? I said, not necessarily. I said, the HIV virus can be dormant in your body for years. Most people begin to see symptoms of the virus seven, 10, or 12 years. Seems to be that, that <clears throat> excuse me, the range when you should see symptoms of undiagnosed, untreated HIV. And he said, well, I'm strong. I said, yeah, people, there are people who have stronger immune systems than you, and that might play a role in you not seeing symptoms. However, in most people, you the the virus shows up in blood tests or in a swab test three months after exposure in rare cases six months 
and in even extremely rare cases, one year. So based on what you've told me, more than enough, more than enough time has passed for you to get tested. And if you have the HIV virus from those three incidents or from any other incident, then, you know, it would show up. I said, secondly, after we do that, we're going to assume it's going to be a good result. I'm not going to expect anything bad. I said, you have to explain this to her. Explain her your concern because right now there's all kinds of things going through her mind and she cares about you and she's been celibate all this time waiting on you. That's not somebody who's invested empty time. That's somebody who has, you know, she's thinking she's feeling you and you just got to have this honest conversation. Like, you got to do this. 2018 is about acceptance and options. Acceptance and options, whatever those options are. You can't just, you can't go through life in denial anymore about anything. And he said, I am just so terrified of that test. I said, I am too. I said, I take that test too. And I am always terrified to take that test. I don't care what anybody says. Like, thank God there's medication out there for people who are positive, but that's not a life you want to be in. And, you know, it changes things, but you can still have a life if it is positive. And yes, you're going to have to reevaluate some things and think about life differently and how you interact with women differently if it is a positive result. But there's still a great majority of chances as a negative result. I said, especially since when HIV is transmitted between couples, there's a higher percentage, higher degree of the, of the degree or percentage that the virus can be passed from a man to a woman rather than a woman to a man because of how women are built, we're receptacles. So, you know, we just sat there. We just sat there talking. And uh, we, we, set a, we set a day. He said he wants to get his mind right. I said, whenever you want to do it. I said, we don't have to do it at all. I said, but, you, but at some point, you got to have this conversation with your woman and explain to her and give her a chance to be there for you. Okay? Give her a chance to be there for you. And you and she's right. You definitely should not be trying to have sex with her if you have any doubt about what your status is, which you do. And condoms condoms are not enough. I don't care what anybody says because condoms break. They slip off. And then as couples become more comfortable with each other, they stop using them. It just happens. One day the man says, oh, I don't want to put it on. Let me just do this. It happens all the time. And so she's being very wise. And you're not. Okay. And um, I, I also told him, I said, until you tell me which one of your sisters did that to you, I'm treating all of them like they're, like they're pedophiles because that's, and that's unacceptable. Okay. And <clears throat> so we talked a couple of hours past and I, and I delicately broached the subject of what kind of lifestyle he may be leading that on three separate occasions he has come in contact with women who thought it was okay to do this. Like you met, I said, and so we talked about that. He met a woman at a club who drugged him, and he met a woman through his sister at his mom's house who drugged him, and then another one at a party. And I'm so that's a very wide range of a coincidence. So there's something about the kind of people he's coming in contact with. And this is something about it. And, and, and you know, I, I don't like to make generalizations and I don't like to cast dispersions and stereotypes against demographics and people, but all three of the women were black and two of them were African. And they were of a certain income level, like working class, lower and middle class. And they were very attractive and they were predatory. And I'm trying to understand that. Like I'm trying to understand because I don't move in those circles, right? Number one, I don't even drink like that. But I've always been the kind of person that if I'm uncomfortable, I leave. I've never been many times I've gone to parties or events with people and I could kind of give a feel. Someone said I was an empath. They said, you're an empath. Can you feel too much? But I can. I can sit somewhere and I can pick up on vibes within three seconds. I can tell if this person really hates my guts. 
I can tell if this person is jealous. I can tell if that person is slimy. I can just look and observe and like these feelings come to me and hit me in my heart and it's in my spirit. Either I feel dragged down or I feel lifted up. And if I don't like how I feel, I don't care who I came with. I'll, I'll, I'll feign a headache and say, I have to go. I'll catch Uber. Though. I'll see you later. You want to come with me? I got to go. If I go out to a club, which I rarely go to now, and I'm in a room, and I'm, you know, in a room full of people, everybody's dancing and men against the wall, drinking and looking crazy. If I don't like that vibe, I'm out. Dinner party. I've been at dinner party, uh, dinner parties with mixed races of people. And if I'm in that dinner party and I sense a, an angry, sarcastic, mean-spirited vibe or elitist vibe at the table, I'm out. I don't stay anywhere where I'm not comfortable. I just don't. I've always been like that. I don't break bread with enemies. If there's somebody that, that, that I know can't stand me or doesn't like me or it's just a mean, nasty, vile person, I don't sit there and listen. I don't let people talk about me to me or about me in indirect terms, indirect ways. I leave. I'm always like that. So I'm trying to understand where his mindset was that on three separate occasions, he did not feel what was going on around him. Like how, how much did alcohol play a role in him not recognizing <clears throat> three separate occasions that he was in danger? And I was trying to figure out how to approach that subject delicately without appearing to sound as if I were blaming the victim. Because I said about women, what were you wearing? What were you doing? How come you didn't know? And it's not that. I don't want to go there with that. Because the bottom line is people who are sexual predators deserve all of that blame all by themselves. All by themselves. And parallel to that, we as the victims or potential victims, we are responsible for being aware of our surroundings so that we don't have to go through what my friend is going through right now. But I tell you, I feel like beating up some people. I'm a loyal friend. You hurt my friend. I'm going to tell y'all a story one day of how one of my friends from years ago were raped and how I got revenge for her. I'll tell you about that one day. That's another video. But this right here is a situation where he has been exposed to three to, to at least three different women that he knows of, but he doesn't even know if if, if there were more women involved because he was passed out. He just knows of these three. It could be anything. And now he has to get tested. And it's affecting how the woman who loves him that he loves can interact with him. It's affecting the intimacy of their relationship. It affects so many things. So many things. So this video is just the purpose the purpose of this video is to demonstrate how dangerous it is out here for all of us, men and women. Men and women. It's already well documented how predatory men can be or certain men can be. And I'm here to, to remind you of how predatory certain women can be and, and, and what environment that can occur in and how and how real it is out here because when these types of, of events happen to people it's not just the event itself it's not just the trauma of the event there are all these ancillary consequences because now my friend is worried about taking this test and it's not enough for me to tell him look take the test because if you are positive you know it's better to go on and get on the medication and keep your body healthy he doesn't want to hear that because it's the idea of knowing that you have it and that it affects how you interact with people and, and having to go through that. And for most people, it's just better not to know until you have to deal with it. I get it. But this all goes back to what I have said in my first three videos, parts one, two, and three, that as much as we don't like talking about HIV, we have to find a way to normalize this discussion. We have to find a way to normalize this discussion and to understand how prevalent it is in our communities for a variety of reasons, not just what happened to my friend, but just 
because this, until they discover a cure, this virus is not going anywhere. But because of the stigma attached to talking about it, look at how it affects all of these other things in our lives, your relationships, what you say to people. This is how HIV spreads because the person who may or may not have it doesn't want to deal with it. And because they're afraid of the stigma or being ostracized or being called dirty, all of these things, they don't have that discussion. We still have these jokes. We have these categories of people. And I'm going to tell you right now, any person who is who is sexually active, including me, anybody who is sexually active or even remotely, married people, single people, teenagers, elderly, the fastest rising group of infections, the elderly, you got to have this conversation. You got to think about it. You got to talk about it. It needs to be a normal part of the discussion. You, you know, if you think you like somebody and y'all are digging each other within a month or two, I'm going to say this first. You shouldn't even be having sex with that person until you've talked about diseases and how you would feel about diseases. But then if you decide to go off and have these to, to, to become intimate, that should be the, the next normal step. It shouldn't take months and months to figure out that someone doesn't want to get tested. This is how this disease keeps getting spread. Everybody is afraid to talk about it. And, you know, I'm pretty gangster about these kind of conversations. When I'm in a group of people, a mixed group of people, and like the word HIV comes up, there was a time when people felt so, so detached from the, the possibility that HIV could affect them. They would just crack jokes. Or they would call people nasty. Oh, nasty, nasty, nasty dick, nasty pussy. Oh, that's a nasty person. I don't let people say that around me. That's not a nasty dick. That's not nasty pussy. You know what that is? A person who is infected with a disease that could kill them. Just like cancer. Just like lupus. All of those things. The difference is that one of the most, one of the most natural biological functions on the planet that keep us populating this earth are, is one of the main uh, routes of transmission. So we have this, this shame and this, and this, we are treated like a scourge because it's associated with the act of sex, but sex got you here. Sex got your children here. Sex is a biological function. And because fluids are exchanged, that's how the disease is easily transferred. But it's just, a, it's a horrible disease. That's it. That's what it is. It has nothing to do with the nastiness of the person. Because there are married women who are in their marriages who are chaste, except for being with their husband. They're getting infected. Are they nasty? Do they now have nasty pussy? It's all of these connotations associated with demonizing the person. And in doing that, it keeps us from feeling empathy for someone who's going through a major life-changing traumatic event. I don't let people talk about that around me in a discouraging way. I don't. I lost friends because of it. I have people who don't associate with me. I don't care. <clears throat> I don't care. We have to we have to talk about this differently. Every person who talks about this in a disparaging manner, you are contributing to the spread because of your manner. Now that person that you could be sitting right next to is not going to share that information. Not going to talk about it because they're afraid. Women don't ask their boyfriends because they're afraid of what he might feel, what he might think. Boyfriends don't tell their women because they're like, oh, how are they going to feel? How are they going to think? If you if you have that open discussion, that can lead to other discussions about is this relationship going to last or even going to occur? If it does, how do we protect the person that's not positive? All of those discussions. Anyway. I think especially in the black community. I think we need to have better discussions. We, we need to frame the discussion of HIV in a different way so people can can start can start being honest about themselves and what their and activities they're engaging in. You're just gonna have to. I have to deal with it because I have two family members that are HIV positive. And I tell you, I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to think about it. I wanted to keep it far, far away. But I wasn't helpful to them by not being there for them. 
and letting them talk about it. So we talk about their T cell count and how they're feeling. And if you have a cold, if you have the flu, what's going on with this? We talk about those things. And, and, and in that, it becomes a normal part of conversation. It's not so stigmatized, it's not so fearful, and I can provide support to that family member. It also reminds me to stay on top of my game. So that's that's it. That's what I got for you. And my part four is about having open discussions and open dialogue. Got to do it, people. Let's do it. Let's encourage that conversation in the communities. Let's encourage that conversation. And um, when you're talking to your, your male or female friends, your spouses, your loved ones, your lovers, and I'm going to throw this, this pitch out there again to all women because of all races and ethnicities, because, because it affects us more deeply than it affects them. Let me tell y'all something. There should be no such thing as casual sex if you're a female. Shouldn't be. <clears throat> you, you, you run the risk of losing too much. I have a couple of friends that are, that, that, you know, they go around to a couple of different men, depending on, you know, what they feel or whatever. They say, oh, we use a condom. I'm like, but condoms slip. A couple of times those condoms broke on my friend. They were terrified. I said, there should be no such thing. It's too easy for us to get it compared to them. There should be no such thing. And now to my male friends, watch who you associate with. Women are predators too. We are. We can be predators too for all kinds of reasons. Marriage, babies, citizenship, just just rank file, just rank behaviors from women that just have the same predatory nature as the common pedophile down the street. Just be careful and be aware of your surroundings and 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 you know what? I'm I'm gonna Say this now, and I'm gonna make sure I say this to my to my nephew, because he's a handsome young man. I could totally see something like this, you know, almost happening to him. I'm gonna remind him to be watchful everywhere you go, have buddy systems in place. And you know, when you're invited somewhere to a party, an event, and you don't know anybody, he's the only one there, you ask that person, can you bring somebody with you? And that person is someone you trust, and you all look out for each other. At the party, at the club, dinner party, I don't care where it is. You look out for your buddy. Buddy systems are good. You need to do them when we were children. When we go to the to the museum, the teacher would say, Where's your buddy? I said, My buddy's right here. You hold your buddy's hand, you walk into the museum with your buddy. Hands would be sweaty and nasty by the end of that day, but you had your buddy in your hand. And we're gonna have to start doing that because we see the level of of, of deception people are willing to go through to get what they want. So that's all I have. I'm going to shut this down now. It's just a longer video, but it was necessary. And I'm going to kind of think and meditate a little bit and figure out how I can help my friend, get him some people to talk to who are licensed counselors, because I'm not a licensed counselor. I'm just a good friend who has an open heart and a ready ear. And, um, and be there for him. Everyone be well.